Necromancers are naturally tanky because of their large health pools and shroud mechanic that allows them to build very aggressively while still being able to survive. For this exact reason, they're one of the most reliable classes in PvE that can often ignore positioning and dangerous situations by just mashing their buttons and still winning. In PvP, playing this way can be very rewarding, but if you're in an unfavorable situation, it can be very punishing to play so recklessly. In other words, you need to know when and when not to go in. If I wanted to play a Necromancer build that can rip through enemies in PvE and PvP like paper, but still have the ability to survive and reposition in PvP and World vs. World, I would definitely choose a Power Reaper. The quickness in Shroud allows you so much burst damage with basically no ramp up time, and the ability to leap with Death Charge in Shroud is invaluable to the otherwise slow Necromancer class. At the moment, Scourges are more popular because they can corrupt boons and do tons of sustained damage from a distance. However, to me, Scourge isn't really a fun playstyle, and while it can give barrier to allies, which is great in group content, you need to maintain shades, which can be a lot more complicated than just pressing one on Reaper and everything dies. So if I wanted to play one Necromancer build everywhere in Guild Wars 2, using one set of gear and changing only my traits and utilities between game modes, it would have to be this one. Let's first go over the basics of Reaper, which will apply to every build. As a Reaper, you gain Life Force, which allows you to enter your powerful shroud from specific skills and when nearby enemies die. Usually each weapon has at least one skill that grants life force and you want to always prioritize landing these. In Shroud, you gain access to many bonuses due to the traits I've chosen, which will essentially make me do tons more damage than when I'm not in Shroud. So I want to optimize how long I am in Shroud. The Shroud abilities are as such. Your one skill has a very quick auto attack chain that will do tons of damage and recharge your other shroud skills by one second every time you finish the chain of three attacks. Because you spend most of your time in shroud pressing one, it gives you a lot of synergy with your other skills. It will also give you more shroud the more enemies that you hit with it. So essentially spamming one will help you to stay in shroud longer and allow you to spam one for longer. Death's Charge is a leap skill that will block projectiles and blind on the end location while dealing a decent burst of damage. Learning to position with the skill is super important. You can detarget and control where it goes more precisely because the pathing can be a little bit weird when the enemy moves in an unpredictable way. Infusing Terror is a two part skill. The first part gives you three stacks of stability and a damage reduction buff and then you can use the second part to do an AOE fear around you. You want to time this skill very well because the stability is very important and the damage reduction helps you to stay in shroud longer, so you want to use the skill early on, but save the fear for near the end of the damage reduction for maximum value. Then there is Soul Spiral. This is your hardest hitting ability in shroud and one of the easiest to land because it just spins all around you and it'll do a lot of poison and a whirl finisher, which is very good for using with your next ability. Executioner's Scythe is a slow animation, but it drops a big stun and leaves an ice field, which you can use to death charge through for the ice aura, which can give you more damage reduction on top of your infusing terror buff, or you can use soul spiral in it to give you chilling bolts. I take all berserker armor, with a Valkyrie ring and two Valkyrie accessories. The rest of my trinkets are Berserker and my weapons are also Berserker. As a Necromancer, you get a lot of value from Vitality because your Shroud generation is based on percentages. So the more Vitality you have, the more Shroud you gain. And because we get lots of Precision and Crit Chance from other places in the build, you can get the value of Vitality without losing a significant amount of damage. I take Rune of the Pack to make up for some of the lost precision and to upkeep my swiftness uptime. You want around 45% crit chance because you'll gain 33% crit chance while in Shroud and then the rest you can get from Fury sometimes. So to avoid wasting stats and overcapping on crit, 
you build for being in shroud since you'll be in shroud most of the time. Then I take a vision sigil and cleansing on my axe and warhorn. Whenever you enter or leave shroud, it will trigger your on swap sigils. So the three seconds of 100% crit chance when leaving shroud or swapping into axe can allow you to keep pushing out big bursts despite having low crit chance in your non shroud weapons. The cleansing sigil is nice, but you could put it on your greatsword instead if you wish. On greatsword, I use energy and hydromancy. Necromancers are known for being very vulnerable because they have no evades after their two dodges are used, so energy really helps them to avoid mechanics they'd rather not tank, or to get slightly more mobility. The hydromancy sigil is mainly to add burst damage and more chill duration, which synergizes very well with reaper. As far as my weapon choices, the axe is just a great ranged burst weapon for all game modes. Focus could be used as a offhand, but generally I prefer Warhorn because the utility of the CC is much better than the Boon Rip in PvE, and in PvP because I'm not running staff, I have no other unblockable CCs which can be very game changing. And the swiftness of time is really nice because you won't always be in combat or be able to enter Shroud to get it. The Greatsword is arguably the best weapon for PvE because of its pure damage output, but in PvP the staff provides a lot of great utility that can help you to kite and poke in situations where the enemy doesn't play fairly. If you do want to use staff instead, use the Soul Marks trait. If you want to see how that playstyle works, I have a video showing how to rotate as a DPS role in PvP, and in that video I have the Staff Reaper build and gameplay. However, I'm going to focus on a great sword playstyle for this video, which will work much better in PvE as well. Let's take a look at the traits of the PvE build. I take Spite, Soul Reaping, and Reaper. In Spite, I take all of the damage modifiers, except for Signets of Suffering. While you can take Awaken the Pain for more damage, you could argue that staying in Shroud longer equates to more damage as well as more survivability. Signets of Suffering works well with the Signet of Undeath to give you more life force generation. So you never have to worry about having too little life force to go in Shroud. The Signet by itself is very good, but with the trait it allows the effect to persist while in Shroud to allow you to stay in Shroud really long. The Signet of Undeath is also a good res utility, which will actually cost you 9000 health to use, but once you go back into Shroud, you can gain the buff again, and that'll give you more Shroud generation, and it'll recharge your Signets faster, and since you're in Shroud anyways, it doesn't matter that you lost 9000 health. In Soul Reaping, I take Unyielding Blast, because my Shroud 1 will give vulnerability, which can stack up really fast with the quickness, and it's just great for group content as well as solo content. Then I take Soul Barbs because even though I'm not entering and exiting Shroud often enough to upkeep this damage buff 100% of the time, I'm still using most of my burst during the 10 seconds around that time. Lastly is Death Perception which gives you 300 ferocity which is like 20% more critical damage while in Shroud and 33% more crit chance. This trait alone increases your damage by so much and is the reason why you want to maximize the time spent in Shroud, because you are just so much more powerful. In Reaper, I take Chilling Nova for extra chill uptime because the Cold Shoulder trait makes you deal a lot more damage to chilled foes. Also take Soul Eater, which makes you do more damage in melee and will heal you for your damage dealt while out of Shroud, because you don't lose health while in Shroud, you're safe there anyways, but you are very vulnerable while out of Shroud. So you need to use the Greatsword skill Nightfall and the Well of Darkness, which will blind enemies as you heal off of them. Finally, there is Reaper's Onslaught. This gives you another 300 Ferocity while in Shroud, so basically you have 40% more crit damage while in Shroud because of the Death Perception trait as well. And you'll pulse permanent quickness to yourself and you will recharge your other Shroud abilities the more you land your auto chain. Some more reasons to value being in Shroud as long as you can. So basically while in Reaper you gain permanent quickness, you have tons more crit chance and crit damage, you give yourself might whenever you use your auto attack and vulnerability, and you have tons of chills, 
damage reduction, and mobility. In other words, you become a monster. I take the Signet of Vampirism because healing is pretty automatic on this build, so you don't really need to use a, a cast time heal. So Signet of Vampirism just lets you keep attacking, and you can also heal while being in Shroud because of the Signets of Suffering trait. And you'll be in melee range most of the time, which will life siphon and do more damage. You can take Spectral Grasp to pull enemies into the grinder, or to take a stun break with Well of Power. Then I take Chill to the Bone for some extra CC for break bars. While out of Shroud, you want to use your biggest damaging abilities and then re-enter Shroud as soon as possible. In Greatsword, you have the Death Spiral, which will give out vulnerability and give you a lot of damage and life force, so it's a pretty important skill to use. You can spam your Grave Digger, but it's a pretty slow ability when you don't have quickness, so I generally don't like to use Grave Digger. Nightfall is a great AoE that will get larger after you cast it, and it will pulse blind and corrupts, so it's just great for handling large packs of enemies. And Grasping Darkness can help you to organize larger groups of enemies. Try to detarget your Grasping Darkness so you can more precisely aim where you want to be pulling enemies from. In Axe, you mainly have the Axe 2 Ghastly Claws, which will do a lot of damage and give you life force, but that's pretty much it. You can use Unholy Feast to remove boons and Locust Swarm to gain Shroud from nearby enemies. And then Whale of Doom is a two second CC, which is great for break bars. If you're in a dangerous situation, you can use your Well of Darkness or your Greatsword Nightfall as soon as you leave Shroud to survive. But to maximize damage, you want to overlap your big damage skills while you have your Shroud buffs. So what you'll often do is use your Wells and your Nightfall and then go into Shroud and do damage while those are also ticking. Alternatively, you can use your Nightfall and then swap into Axe with the Vision Sigil buff and get the 100% crit chance on your ticking AoEs. So generally I'll start out, if I need Shroud, I'll use Death Spiral and then swap into my Axe too to get a little bit of Life Force and then I'll just do my Wells or you know Nightfall and then I'll go into Shroud. So Spectral Grasp, Grasping Darkness, my Greatsword 3, then Greatsword 4, swap to Axe, use my Well, and then go into Shroud to get the maximum bonus from the Wells with the big modifiers. Now I can use my uh, Soul Spiral immediately to get the Soul Barbs effect on it, and while I'm in all of my Wells, I'll get Leeching Bolts from the Blind Field. And then once my Chill wears off, I want to use Executioner's Scythe, and then I want to use Soul Spiral in there to get more of the chill duration because I want the damage modifier from the, uh, the chill there. You can use Infusing Terror right before you leave Shroud for the stability, but you will lose the damage reduction. And then I can use Axe 2, swap to Greatsword, use the Greatsword 3, Greatsword 2, and then wait a little bit. I'll use all of my Wells here, and then I'll Grasping Darkness, and then go in Shroud before the Grasping Darkness lands, and then just kind of repeat, use the whirl while in the leeching bolts and my chill is going to come off soon so i want to use my executioner scythe and yeah that's pretty much how it works and as you can see i i'm not even like optimally buffed here but i self buff myself so much that i get around 14k without even using food so here is a path of fire legendary bounty and i'm going to solo this as the reaper build and usually with bounties there's kind of like a lot of RNG that's involved because there are certain like instabilities and I think I got pretty lucky here because I got the healing tendrils as one of the sort of like instabilities and as a reaper you have such a wide cleave radius that I can just kill the healing tendrils without even having to stop DPSing the boss so that worked out really well here and another thing is that not all bounties can be meleeed, so this is a purely melee build. So if there's ever like a boss where you have to like go ranged, you kind of have to like camp your axe, which isn't that good. But in this case, 
even if I'm in a situation where going into melee is dangerous, I'm still very tanky and can survive doing so. So that's one of the main benefits of the build is that even though it can suffer from being a melee build, a lot of the detractions of being a melee build like you're gonna die, it doesn't. So some of the mechanics that we're facing here is actually yeah pretty melee oriented where like if I was far away from the boss there it would probably hit me more to kind of have to like deal with the poison that's growing underneath the boss and as a reaper you have pretty long radius on your melee attacks too so that kind of makes up for that as well soul spiral there and yeah this is going to be a kind of like the same thing over and over because this boss doesn't really change their mechanics I am slowly CCing them over time because I have the chill duration. So that's another thing is that I get extra damage from having chill on the boss. And that's kind of like a CC towards a break bar, right? Because it's a, um, a movement inhibiting condition. And I think it counts pretty... It's a pretty good CC towards a break bar, the chill. So having permanent chill on a boss kind of prevents its break bar from going up it's just slowly going down as you can see and I can just put in a couple cc's here and there and eventually get the break bar and that'll help me to really dps the boss because not only will they stop doing their mechanics so I can freely cast on them but they'll take more damage when they've been broken so we're about to get the boss's break bar down here very soon and then yeah, killed that healing tendril already, just didn't even think about it. And break bar happens. I am quite low on shroud, but I get a very big 50,000 uh, soul spiral there. I put down my wells as soon as I leave shroud because I'm afraid to get CC'd by that other forge there. But I could have probably saved that for when I'm about to go back in the shroud. I use my chill to the bone there because that kind of fills in the gap between my shroud as well. And I want to get CC'd and die. And I actually lose all of my shroud there. So I use my well of power here, which I'm using instead of the spectral grasp. Because having one stun break on a build is very valuable. Whereas having zero stun breaks is very, very risky. Like the difference between having zero and one is pretty huge. So sometimes. I'll take Well of Power, but if I'm in like Fractals, I'll 100% take Spectral Grass because you can pull people in with that, you can pull them in with your Greatsword 5, and once you've organized all the enemies into like one little bundle, it's really easy for you to just kill them all because you just have this wide AoE cleave. So you'll notice in a lot of situations, Reaper just deletes everything, and you'll see this isn't actually a solo. My, my solo has been ruined by one of these random adventurers who instantly died. So you can kind of see like the difference between survivability there. They instantly die and I get them, the boss, to, you know, 90% of their health. So normally I would probably res, yeah, I'm going to res them eventually because probably they probably need this bounty and I'm going to help them out. But yeah, normally I would res them, but in this situation, I'm kind of hesitant because it delegitimizes my solo. So yeah, I'm kind of mad. But anyways, this is a pretty much how you play Reaper. You just press the one. That's yeah, that's pretty much it. You just press one. In PVP, you don't have access to as greedy of a build because spite isn't really giving you as much utility and you can't really use the nerfed signets to the same effect. So I take blood magic with the ritual of life just for a little bit more resing utility for my team because the other traits aren't really useful. Obviously vampiric presence for the sustain for you and your team. And then unholy martyr which is going to give you a lot of condition cleanse which is really good. So in soul reaping I take speed of shadows which is going to give you Condition removal when you enter shroud and swiftness. This is really good because it makes you hard to catch and it allows you to get swiftness uptime 
which is always kind of like a weird thing on Necro. You always have to build around how you're going to get your movement speed. And since I'm not taking the staff, I can conveniently take Speed of Shadows, which is kind of like the main thing that's really good about Greatsword is that you can take this trait. Then I take Vital Persistence because it gives you a little bit more sustain. You can take Soul Barbs, which gives you more damage, but I choose the extra sustain because on Necromancer, you really never worry about whether you're doing too much damage or not enough damage. It's always whether you can survive. So I prefer a little bit more sustain, but yeah, you can obviously take Soul Barbs. And then obviously Death Perception because while you're in Shroud, it's still your main damage source. In Reaper, I take Chilling Nova for the extra chill duration, which is always good. Then I take Chilling Victory because whenever you hit a foe with chill on them, you give yourself Might and Life Force. And Might is always good, but the Life Force generation on the PvP version is going to be a lot more necessary than the PvE version because you're going to take a lot more pressure. So I'm going to choose that over the Soul Eater because... This is more of like a greedy trait where you have to be out of shroud, which is when you're very vulnerable. And yeah, it's just not as useful because more shroud is more survivability as well. And then obviously you're gonna be taking Reaper's Onslaught because you just want that extra damage in shroud. I take the Marauder Amulet because vitality is really good. And the Rune of Speed because it gives more vitality and it gives you extra movement speed while you have swiftness. It's pretty good because as a full melee build, you want to stick to your target. And even though you have a lot of chills and stuff like that, if you're not on top of your enemy, then you're getting kited and you lose a lot of your sustain because you got to be hitting things to get your sustain from blood magic. And then on the axe and warhorn, I take opportunity and exposure because whenever you swap into your axe, you want the vulnerability to get the two skill which is ghastly claws which will do more damage the more vulnerability that the target has on them so it scales very well with vulnerability and the opportunity is because you have lots of chills and cripples that will easily allow you to do more damage then in the great sword i just take energy cleansing for the utilities i take consume conditions because you want that condi cleanse and spectral armor because it is the highest shroud generating skill in the game so long as you're getting hit. So it gives you 8% of your shroud on probably like a one second internal cooldown. And it gives you a little bit of protection as well. And basically you can use this skill and then go into shroud. And then you've got the extra life force generation while in shroud. And it allows you to stay in Shroud for a really long time because you're gaining so much Shroud while you're in Shroud. So basically, Shroud generation is damage as a Reaper. Then you take Spectral Grasp, which is very good for pulling enemies closer to you because, as I said before, you don't want to get kited. So pulling them in is super important for landing your damage. And it gives Chill, which is going to give you Life Force from Chilling Victory. And it also gives 15 Life Force per target that it hits. So if you're in a team fight and you hit the entire enemy team, that's gonna give you basically full shroud. If you're 1v1ing a Mesmer, which is something that hard counters you, and you hit all their clones, you've now got a ton of shroud that can change the momentum of that fight. Then you've got Spectral Walk. Obviously this is pretty bread and butter for Necromancers. You just get Condi Cleanse from it, which is really important, and you can use it to juke. Then I take Chill to the Bone because it's more CC to land my skills. It's more stability, which helps me to survive. You can take Lich, but I feel that Lich is very easy to counter. A lot of people know how to play around it. They either reflect and then you kill yourself, or they use Line of Sight and then you get kited, or they just pressure you and it's hard for you to kite on Lich because you can't use the attack from behind anymore. So Lich Form is a lot more counterplayable now. I like Chill to the Bone because it gives me more CC that's more reliable and there's a lot more play to it. So you'll try to use Ghastly Claws as your main damage in Axe and then Kite with Unholy Feast, which you can use while facing any direction. So it's really good for kiting. 
and Whale of Doom is an unblockable CC, so it's really good for using in team fights to interrupt reses. You want to usually save Whale of Doom unless you're getting really pressured and then you can use it to get them off you. Nightfall is a really good offensive but also really good defensive skill. It's probably one of the best skills on the Greatsword. Then you want to land Death Spiral because this is going to give you a lot of vulnerability and life force. And then what you want to do is try to land either your Grasping Darkness or your Spectral Grasp and that will pull them and then you want to like precast your Death Spiral into it. So you do like Grasping Darkness and then Death Spiral and if they get pulled into you, this guy wouldn't get pulled, but if they get pulled into you, you would use it or you can use your Greatsword too as well. But usually I'd say that the, the Death Spiral does more damage. It actually does do more damage. So it's a lot better of a skill to use Death Spiral than to use Grave Digger unless you've got nothing else to do. Then when you go in Shroud, what I like to do is just immediately use my infusing terror and most people will dodge as soon as you go into shroud and then after they dodge you can land the terrify and that'll chill them and then you can soul spiral while they're feared and they'll usually dodge after that and then you can executioner sight them after their second dodge and if they get a two second stun with no cooldowns you can just auto attack them to death so that's kind of how i like to play around the the shroud is you're baiting out cooldowns to land your big burst and then if none of that works out you know you leave shroud you use chill to the bone and then you can land your great sword abilities on them you can kind of like supplement the burst with your ghastly claws as well and you want to remember that spectral armor can be used aggressively and defensively because while it does allow you to be in shroud longer which is kind of defensive because it's a second life bar your shroud is your damage so if you use Spectral Armor and then go into Shroud and people are just randomly hitting you even though you're playing aggressively, they may counter pressure a little bit and you gain 8% of your life force per second that you're being hit. And Shroud equals pretty much everything on Reaper. So you want to be getting as much Shroud as possible. So this is a ranked PvP match as the Greatsword Power Reaper. I get a little bit of stealth here for my team, which is actually really nice because Necromancers usually have pretty low shroud at the start of a match, and especially on a great sword reaper, you don't have staff to poke and get your shroud very fast. But I do have spectral grasp, which as you can see gave me quite a bit of my shroud already. So it allows me to play more aggressively and I get I think that was Grenade Barrage, so I lost all of my Shroud to Grenade Barrage. And I port back in with my Spectral Walk to try to pressure them, but they back off. And I try to reconvene with my team, but I see that the Hall is coming back in for me. So I have to focus them or they're going to focus me. I use my Shroud too in my Ice Field there, which gives me a lot of chill and damage reduction, which is really good in this matchup. I land a really good Spectral Grasp after they use their crate on me because I can hit all of those those turrets and it'll give me a ton of shroud. So I'm doing really well right now. And of course, Reaper is really good at cleaving downstate bodies. So we finish off a lot of these kills for our team. And we're going to get this kill here. My Mesmer is heading towards home, which is good. And we're just gonna finish up these next kills and then probably head into far. So I noticed that my other Reaper is coming into far with me. We don't both need to be there and cap that node. So I'm gonna head back into mid to try to help out my team to hold mid, but they gave up the node immediately. So I'm gonna try to get, yeah, I've got chilled by the staff marks there. So I use my shroud to get closer, but I leave Shroud and now their respawns are on top of me and I'm in a really bad spot. So actually I'm one second away from getting into Shroud again, but I'd probably still die even if I got into Shroud. So that's kind of like the, I mean, you're very vulnerable as a Reaper, but what you often want to do is you want to use your Reaper 2, the Death Charge, before you leave Shroud every time because you can reposition, get a safer position and then leave Shroud and then you got a little bit more time 
to get back in your shroud. But what I did there was I used the Reaper to thinking that I was in a safe positioning, but then I hadn't the awareness of the respawns behind me and I ended up not being in a safe position and I'm going to die. So that's kind of, that is one of the main things you want to be aware of on Necromancer is when you leave Shroud. So I'm going to head into the buff right now. I'm going to have to 1v1 the Hollow Smith. I use my Greatsword 5 from below and that's one thing that's really good about that skill is that it can be kind of like used up and down terrain and can often like pull people off of like ledges and stuff like that or get you like an advantage before the enemy knows that you're going to be engaging on them like I did there. So now we're trying to win the bells as a team fight. The Hollowsmith is pretty low so I land a chill to the bone, they go down and I'm going to cleave them out with my reaper shroud. My ally goes down as well so I go into my stability and just cleave as hard as I can with my auto attack and soul spiral. And now at this point, oh my god, that is so beautiful. So my other Reaper pulled them into my auto attack spam. So it was like just pulling them into the grinder. That's like one of the best feelings there. So I think we're in a pretty good spot here. Our Revenant died at far. But we've got the bell and we're going to cap mid. I probably am going to assume that their Reaper is low on cooldowns here. But yeah, their Hollow Smith is coming in, so I need to get out of here. This is a very dangerous spot for me because, yeah, I probably shouldn't have come in here. So knowing that my ally was dead there meant that I probably should have went somewhere else. Now there's actually a third player on me, so this is very... Yeah, I'm pretty much dead here. I'm going to put down my Chill, which is a nice stun on the Hollow Smith, which will probably prevent them from getting me here. I do an about face on my Greatsword 5 to give them another chill. I do the Spectral Grasp and that gives me a little bit more Shroud to get out of the way here and I'm actually gonna get the decap here probably. I get feared from the staff marks and yeah I'm gonna die so I greeted for the decap there. We still got it because my Mesmer was there. But yeah, I should have just kept kiting because I knew that they had invested so much in the kill for me. And yeah, that was a really bad play from me. I could have survived. But we do kind of have the rest of the map because I survived so long in that outnumbered situation. So yeah, I'm going to die again. If, you, if you're in like a match where you're not like winning, you're usually going to die a lot on Necro. And in this match, I'm winning and still dying quite a lot. So you got to kind of get used to that and try to rotate into situations where you either have your team there already, you know, not like an ally who's already dead or in a situation where, you know, there's not that many enemies potentially, or there's not like a potential of more enemies coming in. So I go into mid because honestly, this is probably a bad idea because I just, I literally just told my past self to not try to be solo and to go for your team so yeah i am here with my mesmer but the bell is up and we we have to play for that so i'm kind of forced to go in for that i barely miss my executioner scythe and i'm going probably oh no there's actually three of them here and there's one capping the bell so interesting rotations by my team to go cap middle instead of go for the bell here but anyways yeah i'm caught out again and this is not a very good situation for us because now i'm dying a third time this match if you've died three times that's generally enough if you die any more than three times in a match then you're you're kind of feeding right so you need to start playing more passively and worrying about your own life more because the enemy is recognizing that you're probably a free kill and i am definitely a free kill and we're getting snowballed off that and i'm going to go into mid but this time instead of engaging fully okay i actually engage fully so i haven't really learned yet but i i play a little bit more safely i go in a little bit and then i back off and try to use terrain and i see that their weaver is going to not hold the node Okay, so they're deciding who's going to hold the node versus me. And we still have a decent amount of lead. 
So it's fine for me to do this so long as my team gets something done on the rest of the map. So their Reaper goes in the Shroud and I see that my Rev is here so maybe we can go in for this 2v2. I double dodge to avoid the Reaper and now that the Reaper is out of their Shroud I know that they're a free kill. I go into Shroud immediately Soul Spiral and I save my Shroud 2 to chase them but now the Renegade is on me or that's a that's a yeah core and then they lich me. So I'm dead a fourth time this match. So as you can see, this is not a very good match for me. I'm kind of feeding. My team is not really getting too much done while we're outnumbered. They don't kill very fast. And then as soon as I die, we instantly get killed. So at this point, I'm thinking, okay, like we're about to throw this match. So I really need to stop dying. Dying is the worst thing you can do. And I just keep, I can't stop dying for whatever reason. Um, even though I played somewhat safely and then played kind of aggressively because my teammates arrived, more of theirs arrived. So now here we're 2v1ing this Reaper, which is a good situation. This is finally a situation I can't really die in. So we're going to use Chill to the Bone there. They port away. I'm going to actually get the decap there, but I'm not going to full cap because I know that my teammates really need me in these fights. If I decap, it's kind of like leaving them to die like they left me to die. So I land some stuff here. Yeah, we're just going to leave that Reaper because I want to get the... They actually, they actually got the buff? Okay, so yeah, they just got the, the bell. So we're in a really bad situation now. I'm going to go into far because there's no point in getting any more kills there. There's no objective. I go into far to plus one my Mesmer so that they can get the node and we can just go somewhere else. So they're going to leave, which is a good play by them, but they're kind of low on cooldowns. I get the soul spiral and I see that their rev is kind of low here too. I dodge their jade winds and I use my axe too. So yeah, I'm going like full postal right now. I'm just trying to kill everyone because I've been dying way too much. So it's, it's time for me to start killing again. So we get two kills there, which is good. Now we go into mid, but our Reaper is down. I go for the res with my team, which is really good. And now we can go on their hollow. I get a really good executioner scythe and they take most of their life there. So I try to go for the pull from afar. Yeah. So one thing about uh, spectral grasp is it's hard to hit on players who are moving away from you, but if they're far away but moving towards you, it's really easy to land. So I land a really good chill to the bone there and I'm actually, I'm 1v2 again, so I, I really haven't learned my lesson. I'm still trying to like pop off in these situations where I'm, I'm at a disadvantage. So here, probably gonna use my great sword four on the down body. Yeah, we get a really good cleave there. So I put my great sword four, I detarget the, the spectral grasp there I actually pull in their reaper I didn't even see the reaper was there so I'm outnumbered again um, yeah I really need to play safe here so where am I gonna go I actually land the executioner on their reaper yeah so I'm gonna go kite up here and we're starting to gain the map because our mesmer is playing their role very well they're winning their 1v1s and the rest of my team is I guess they capped home while I was outnumbered so their hollow smith is on me now I'm just trying to pressure them to get them off me. I land a really good fear and blind them and then we're going to get the kill here. So now this is a really good situation because the bell is coming up and we can win off of that. But I also realized that we can probably win off of just winning far as well. So I, I go to that because it's a little bit more reliable to hold this node. And yeah, I'm just going to press my one skill there, get a nice fear and we finish that kill off so the only way we can lose right now is if we lose bell so i'm just going to go there to try to stall and we will probably win this match so yeah we win the match and that is how you play reaper and ranked actually no that's that's not how you play reaper and ranked you don't do that you don't feed do not as i do world versus world is going to be pretty much the same build as pvp 
except you're going to be taking summon flesh worm instead of the spectral armor because you're not really trying to be in a fight for extended amount of time like you're fighting over a node usually necromancers in world versus world really need that added escape potential because while most people think that necromancers are very slow and they are it doesn't mean they don't have escape potential in fact they have one of the best escape potential because escaping in world versus world is about burst mobility so if i'm like a warrior and i'm just running away from someone then they can just keep following me and even though i move fast as a warrior it depends on how many people are chasing you but as a necromancer say you're getting chased by like a bunch of people what i can do is i can put my worm over there and then run in this direction and then just juke over here and they don't know which way i've went because they they can't see which way the worm is being casted i can get out of combat and then i'm pretty much home free once i've gotten on my mount so that as well as the spectral walk which can kind of have like the same effect where you're i mean they know where you're gonna port back to so they have to decide to split up to to prevent you from escaping but still you're causing them to split up and that's giving you more of a chance to survive and you can even do a double play where you summon flesh worm and then you use your spectral walk and then you port to your necrotic traversal and then your spectral walk return spot is all the way over there where you started and then you can do like stomp plays and stuff like that which can be really nice for getting kills secured in world vs world in situations that you may not be able to control but that is how you play the reaper in world vs world if you want to see how i specifically play it in instance situations of roaming then stick around but for now thank you for watching and thank you for supporting me if you'd like to support me more you can do so in the links below and i will see you guys next time